scale or 114 GEV to a TEV scaler. So the data here, these two curves, the red and the blue, prefer a relatively light scaler. All right, so let me s say this in another way. We looked for this scaler at left the uh, electron-positron collider at CERN. It was an E plus E minus collider looking for a Z plus a scalar, and it excluded a scalar up to a mass of about 114 GeV, assuming this minimal standard model. Okay, so these electroweak measurements, these tables of many, many data points, prefer a light scalar. So this is a chi-squared fit as a function of the scalar mass here. And the minimum of the chi-squared is at 87 GeV. And of course, that should worry you because that's in a region excluded by direct searches. The direct searches are this yellow line here of 114 GeV. But note the large errors. It only depends logarithmically on the scalar mass. So when I actually do my statistics, a 95% confidence upper bound is 186 GeV. So we, we suspect that uh, this scalar is less than about 186 GeV. There's no particular reason, in my mind, to prefer any point in this plane here. However, these fits are indirect. They assume the standard model with the weakly interacting scalar, this minimal model. And it's, okay, so there's been another set of uh, people who are doing fits to all this data. This, this fit here is from the elect, LEP Electroweak Working Group. The G fitter group is the group that brought you S fitter, CKM fitter. They they do a lot of fits to data, and so this is an independent approach. It's a chi squared fit as a function of the scalar mass, and this yellow curve here looks pretty much like the curve on the previous page. But what they have done is they've included uh, direct search limits, which we'll hear about at the end of the afternoon. They've included those limits in their fit, and that's what makes it kind of jagged here. These, so you can see that the limits from Fermilab are actually changing these indirect limits. The other thing they've done is they've included theoretical uncertainties, and you can see that there's a band on this. But nonetheless, the bottom line is here's the three sigma limit right here, and it's about 160, 170. So we expect that if the minimal standard model with a single scalar is true, that this scalar is relatively light. So in my pragmatic approach, who needs this scalar boson? Well, you need it to agree with all the electroweak precision measurements because all this data fits this theory perfectly. Okay. However, the standard model isn't the only theory that can predict these measurements. It's, it's easy. It's duck soup to take this model of electroweak symmetry breaking and complicate it and expand it to make it more complicated. This particular plot on this axis is isospin violation, and on this axis is essentially the running of the Z propagator from Q squared of zero up to Q squared of MZ squared. And then it fits to the exactly the same data as on the uh, previous slide. So here's the fits to uh, the W mass, for example. And the black dot in the middle is the fit from all this data. And as you try to make the scalar heavier, heavier in this 185 GeV, you move away from the data, okay? So it's easy. What do I have to do if I want to have, say, a 1 TeV scalar particle? I need to construct a theory with a large positive delta T to get me back up to the fit. And so one example would be a fourth generation of fermions with a large mass splitting. That'll do it. There are lots of ways to do it. So if I have a theory where the scalar is heavier than these limits, there's going to be something else which puts me back into agreement with all my data. Okay. Supersymmetry is a favorite alternative to the standard model. If you want to compare your predictions with the predictions of some other theory, well, supersymmetry is our favorite. So supersymmetry, you have a partner particle for all the known particles. The electroweak symmetry breaking is broken in exactly the same way as in the standard model, except you have five scalar particles now instead of just one. But the nice thing about supersymmetry is that the minimal version is extremely predictive. So this is exactly the same plot as I showed you before, the top quark mass and the W mass. The black curve is the experimental numbers, and the blue curve is the standard model fit. So those are the same curves I showed you before. And in the minimal supersymmetric theory, you get this red curve or this pink curve. So th the minimal supersymmetric theory with five scalars can fit our data, too. <coughs> and in fact, it's a slightly better chi-squared fit. All right, so to continue, well, who needs a scalar anyways? 
Okay, well, we fit our data with it, but it also has a theoretical reason. If I look at WW scattering, so W plus W minus goes to W plus W minus, the amplitudes with gauge boson exchange grow with energy. The amplitudes with scalar exchange also grow with energy, but the couplings are exactly right so that the contributions which grow with energy cancel. Okay. So the standard model scalar has just the right coupling so the amplitudes don't grow with energy. So if I start messing around with my theory, adding new particles, new couplings here, I change this cancellation. Okay. So what does this mean? Well, on very general grounds, we expect that the scalar is relatively light. If I look at the polarization of these W particles, the polarization vector is just their energy over MW, so the scattering of the longitudinal gauge bosons has a piece which grows with energy and then a piece which is cut off by the scalar mass. So unitarity conservation, the conservation of probability, requires either that the scalar is relatively light, less than about 800 GeV, or if I remove the scalar from the theory, if I go back here and just remove these pieces with the scalar, then something happens at around a TeV, and hence my statement that the LHC is the machine we need, because if I don't see my light scalar, well then something's going to happen around 1.2 TeV. Okay. So the question really isn't where is the scalar, but rather what unitarizes the WW scattering. So the symmetry could be weakly coupled, like supersymmetry where you have lots of pieces. You could have a lot of scalar gauge singlets here. The uh, happy particle could be a series of happy particles, singlets here. And in fact, this is particularly nice because the lightest could be a dark matter candidate. You could have extra dimension models with multiple vector bosons, which unitarize the theory. Symmetry breaking could be strongly coupled, and it could be something like a techni row here. So there are lots of possibilities here. So can we measure? Is this just Gadonk and WW scattering? We don't have beams of W. And of course the answer is yes, we do have beams of W particles. At the LHC we have quarks here, here's two quarks, spitting out gauge bosons, this is either a W or a Z, interacting to make two gauge bosons coming out. So if we didn't have this scalar, the longitudinal interactions here, gauge boson interactions, would rise with energy because I spoiled this cancellation of the energy. Well, can we see this effect? This is an electroweak process here. These are gauge bosons. There's no color exchange. So what happens? These outgoing quarks go forward. We can tag them. So you tend to have fewer central jets than the background. However, there are many backgrounds. And these are very small effects. Typically, the studies require, say, 300 inverse vector bars. So this is not physics that we're going to do probably in the next decade. This is long-term physics. Okay. So let me just show you a plot of what happens. If I look at longitudinal vector scattering, as I've said, it has terms which grow with energy if I go away from the standard model. So what this is, is the plot of vector boson scattering. So this is PP goes to W plus W minus in this particular curve. So it's through this process. So we're measuring the invariant mass of these outgoing Ws here. Okay. Well, the transverse Ws are these dotted ones up here. And they're not very interesting because they don't have anything to do with electroweak symmetry breaking. In the standard model, here are the longitudinal Ws going out. Okay, nothing very interesting. So now this curve A equals zero is where I've messed around with the couplings, made some non-standard interactions between these scalars. And you can see that it's actually growing with energy.